So let's get started. Um, Georgia, where is it? Uh, we have a sort of administrative map here from, uh, from the USSR. You can see that uh, it's a complex ethnographic linguistic region. That's because uh, the Caucasus Mountains, which generally run uh, this red line here, there's a huge mountain range that's higher than the Rockies, higher than the Alps. It's a new mountain range, and it's historically separated uh, the steppe to the north with this mountainous region. This whole area down here is uh, very mountainous, including all of uh, eastern Turkey, Armenia, and then this is more, Azerbaijan is more of a floodplain at this point. Here you can see some of the topography of the region that I'm talking about. This area, Dagestan, was called by the Persians the mountain of languages because there are some 29 totally distinct languages just in this region here that developed over millennia. Uh, some are related to Turkish languages, others to uh, Indo-European languages like Farsi, Armenian, uh, or the Slav languages. And then there's another group that are called the Caucasian language group. There's some 60 languages in the Caucasian language group, of which one smaller grouping is Kartuli, which we know as, uh, as Georgian. It's excellent. And uh, within the Kartuli language group, there are four languages. So think of it like Romanian or, or, or Roman sort of Latin languages within the context of European languages. And then there are anomalies, just like in Europe we have Basque or Finno-Ugric, there are languages just here that seem to, to have no relation to anything else. The Georgian group is not Indo-European, for example. It doesn't have analogy elsewhere in the world. Okay. Uh, in the Middle Ages, or uh, more properly, in the um, mid-fourth century, Georgia was Christianized. Uh, the apostles are said to have preached on the Black Sea coast here in Georgia, Apostle Andrew and Apostle Matthias, uh, but that's maybe hagiographical. There's no precise evidence for it. What we do have evidence for is a, a young woman named Nino came from somewhere in Anatolia. She spoke Aramaic, and she traveled uh, to Jewish speaking, uh, Jewish communities, Aramaic speaking, in the South Caucasus preaching Christianity, and she was able to work a number of miracles, and the king and queen of this East Georgian kingdom here converted in what most scholars agree was around 326 AD, becoming one of the first Christian nations, so to speak, along with Armenia, and, and uh, of course Constantinople uh, just before that. So um, what this map is showing is the, the proliferation of monasteries over the next thousand years. You can see the dates of these monasteries. And I, my main aim here is to show that uh, Georgian Christianity was not limited to you know, what's Georgia. You can see the grouping here, obviously. But some of the major uh, hymnographic centers, places where Georgian manuscripts and books and new notation uh, was developed, were uh, in these centers around Jerusalem. And a lot of the manuscripts created here in Jerusalem end up in the, in the library of St. Catherine's Monastery in Sinai, where they are to this day. There are at least 50 manuscripts there. Uh, this area, there's a region called the Black Mountain, somewhere around Antioch, where there were a number of Georgian monasteries. Also, it hasn't been investigated, but there's a confirmed Georgian monastery here in Cyprus. One of the most important is the Ibiron Monastery here at Mount Athos which was uh, one of the four great lavras of Mount Athos uh, and, and one of the most important Georgian hymnographic centers. Nine and 10 represent, there are some 300 churches and maybe 50 monasteries in this region that's now in Turkey. I lead tours there in the summer. In fact, we're going this summer. All of these monasteries and churches are in ruin. They were part. They were under Ottoman control for the last 400 years. But some of the great scriptoria were here, and uh, manuscripts produced in this region are, are all over the world. There's one in St. Petersburg. Uh, some found their way down here. Others are preserved way up in tiny valleys in the high Caucasus Mountains. There's five manuscripts from before 1000 AD in a museum up here in the top of the mountains. It's unbelievable. And one of them has new notation in it. So uh, 
just to, to show, to talk about what a rich resource the Georgian Chance Studies uh, can be for future international scholarship and comparative work. So this is Georgia today, uh, though Putin has taken bites here and, <laughs> and here. <laughs> Uh, but uh, this is the internationally recognized borders of Georgia today. But in the past, of course, it has uh, expanded and contracted. In the 12th century, it was double this size. Uh, and in, in other centuries, uh, basically Georgia as a kingdom didn't exist for, um, uh, from the Mongol invasions in 1225 until the Russians reconsolidated Georgia and incorporated the Tsarist Emperor. That happened between 1800 and 1828. So for that intervening eight centuries, uh, the Persians sort of had this section and the Ottomans had this section. And they would often play out this sort of epic empire battles here in these, in these places in Armenia and in Georgia. Uh, these were contested grounds for major empires. And when the Russians move in in the early 19th century, they continue to be contested grounds. So all of these these, this whole area is dotted with fortresses from the medieval period, which were then reconstituted as Ottoman fortresses, and so were uh, overrun by Russians, and there are like, you know, cannonballs strewn around, literally, the museums are full of sort of 19th century battle gear. Uh, so <clears throat> this is some of uh, the history of Georgia is, is beset with uh, foreign invasion, empires, uh, destruction of the Orthodox uh, sort of churches, scriptoria manuscripts. Therefore, there are, there are very few manuscripts from this period between the Mongols and the Russians. Uh, Pre-Mongols, there are quite a number of manuscripts, I'd say 100. Uh, but after, say, 1250 to 1800, there are very few manuscripts, and there are none that we know of that, that reflect a hymnographic tradition. Uh, that is with some type of music meditation. There are copies of liturgical texts, hymnographic texts, but we know there was a great scriptorium here in the uh, 15th and 16th century. Nothing survives because in 1616 and then again in 1620, Shah Abbas II from, from Persia came and totally destroyed this place. There's fantasies that some of these manuscripts found their way into private holdings and somehow survived somewhere in Isfahan and whatnot, but this is just speculation. So what this map is showing are uh, the prominent monasteries that emerged during the, the Russian Tsarist period. So the 19th, uh, late 18th, 19th century, uh, these are the monasteries where chant was, was still thriving um, and where we, uh, where we have distinct harmonic, melodic traditions. So generally they can be sort of lumped in East Georgia and West Georgia because there's a small mountain range here which is an ancient mountain range compared to the Great Caucasus, but it's very difficult to traverse. Uh, it would take a couple of weeks on a donkey to try and get through here. And so that geographical boundary also separated the, uh, the political sort of cultural regions of Georgia, and, and you have different type of chant developing here and a different type of chant developing there. And within each region there are, there are significant harmonic uh, differences as well, but the east-west divide is the greatest one, musically speaking. Okay, now let's get into some sources, and forgive me if I just sort of zoom through this. This is obviously in a, 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 large, uh, a large thing that we're trying to go over. So sources, we just sort of zipped through that, but um, you'll see that there are uh, a number of words. These are the sort of categories that we're going to go through here. Transcriptions, various new traditions, uh, both the medieval and the 18th and 20th centuries. A couple of published sources, the sound recordings, and then we'll talk about oral transmission before we get to our assignment. So preservation efforts. Uh, begin with this uh, sort of uh, uh, intelligentsia, a, a bishop that came from the intelligentsia class. He was an aristocrat, well-educated. Um, he was within now the Russian Orthodox Church. The Russians uh, abolished the, Georg the independence of the Georgian Orthodox Church in 1811. This is important for Georgian chant studies because previous to that, um, 
uh, chant studies or, or the, the training of new chanters have happened in church institutions like seminaries and uh, cathedral schools. And master chanters were supported by the economy of the church and promising young uh, students were brought there and then trained to chant in the apprenticeship system which lasted four to six years and then they would go back to their sort of regional parish churches or monasteries. And that was how the, um, the, the, the transmission of chant functioned in the 18th century. When the Russians abolished the independence of Dor the Georgian church, they consolidated 25 dioceses into five, and they controlled the economy such that all of the church income would go to Moscow and then return to Georgia and be reallocated according to colonial Russian principles, which did not include Georgian chant study. In fact, it includes Slavonic chant study. And this was the cause of a lot of uh, protests with, for uh, Georgian students in the Georgian seminary. Uh, they would, were forced to learn uh, Russian, Slavonic, and set um, Georgian liturgical texts to Slavonic four-part harmony. And they rebelled, and, they, and they, there was a lot of uh, discontent. And that's why people are always surprised. Joseph Jugashvili, known as Stalin, studied in the seminary in Tbilisi. And people said, oh, he must have been such a pious you know, how is, how is such a, a later monster in a seminary? Well, actually, the seminary was a hotbed of rebellion. And one of the rectors of, the, of this seminary got stabbed to death in, in 1884 by a discontented student. So this is the milieu that, that Stalin is growing up in, in the seminary. It was a place of deep suppression of aspiring young Georgians who were trying to find their national identity. But this is a, a process of suppression. So where does the bishop come in? In 1860, he founds this Committee for the Preservation of Georgian Church Chant. And he tries to activate the, the aristocratic class in Georgia to sponsor the preservation of chant. Uh, and their first aim was to find the ma existing master chanters that were still in the villages. As I mentioned, after 1811, none of the Georgia master chanters worked in any institutions. So they returned to their farms, they taught their children or any locals that they could find, and the oral chant tradition continued in the village context for some 50 years. By the 1860s, therefore, there were not many master chanters left. If there were thousands uh, in 1800, by 1860, it was under 100. Um, so their first efforts were to bring these master chanters to a central location and, and restart schools. So um, the bishop found uh, one of their last master chanters and, in East Georgia and brought him to the Bullet Bay Monastery, which if we go back to that um, map here. Uh, so we have to BBC here, this is the capital of the country. Um, Bullet Bay Monastery here is six. Uh, the, the Karbalashvili was the name of the last master chanter. He was uh, born here, and the bishop brought him here, and he started a chant school here for three years and trained a new generation. In just three years, he trained the last generation of East Georgian chanters. So he was here from 1860 to 1862. Then he's brought to Tbilisi and teaches there for a while. Uh, but it's really the students that learn here in the, in the village context that then become the informants for later transcriptions in European notation. And this, this uh, Karbalashvili also trained his sons uh, during that time. Let's uh, quick zoom forward again. So around this time, um, there was a, um, uh, the Iveria newspaper in Tbilisi was publishing uh, national poetry uh, Georgian language uh, homilies from, uh, from uh, prominent bishops, such as the one that we just looked at, uh, moralistic uh, sermons and this type of, uh, uh, these types of um, uh, literature were being published in a press in Tbilisi, and this was sort of fueled and run by the, the democratic nationalists who were Georgian intelligentsia trained abroad in Moscow, St. Petersburg, Warsaw, and they were returning not to, uh, to promote the, the colonial empire of the Tsar, but rather to reinvigorate some vision of, a, of a Georgia, an ancient Georgia that was united, had its own language, its own culture, its own church, uh, its own monarchy. So these were monarchists 
and they were set in opposition to young radicals like Stalin and Miller Jordania, and then this would play out over the next 30 years eventually, obviously. The Mensheviks and Bolsheviks went out, the monarchists are all, uh, you all know this, this story, the, the, the uh, sort of intelligentsia class all have to flee to Europe. But still, now we're in the 1880s, 1890s, the, uh, the, the nationalist democrats are in control. They run these, uh, these uh, newspapers. And one of the young workers at one of these newspapers was Efteme Kera Savidze, who was canonized as a saint in 2003. Yesterday was his feast day. He's one of the most important figures in German chant history because he studies chant while he's working at this press and creates this book that you see pictured. Inside the book is his handwritten uh, texts that he learns orally from a master chanter and he applies his own new imitation. So, if you, um, here's a close up. Well, this is text, and you see the new notation. Eerie parallels to Winchester. Mm -hmm. I'm not claiming anything. We're, we're separated by a millennia, millennium. Um, so, but more importantly, uh, Kata Savidze, as a young man studying this notation, later inherits all of the transcriptions from everyone else working on, on transcriptions. So from 1910 until 1936, in other words, through the most volatile period uh, in, in, in the Caucasus, we have World War I, you have a new Menshevik government uh, that's elected. Uh, the, the Georgian church reinstates its autocephalic independence and elect a patriarch. That patriarch is murdered. The Bolsheviks come in and take over. They kick out all the Menshevik government, flees to France in 1921. The Bolsheviks crack down on intelligentsia and all of the, all of the uh, monastics. There's the purges of 1924 and churches and cathedrals being destroyed everywhere. And then through this whole period, this one figure, uh, Kera Savidze, has in his possession literally uh, 5,000, 10,000 pages of uh, hand transcribed notation that is buried underground at various points. He has to move it between different monasteries, fleeing uh, gangs of thugs. I mean, it is an adventure novel. And when you read this story, it's unbelievable uh, that these, uh, the, the transcriptions that he saves remain in our possession. In 1936, he ends up giving them to the museum uh, in Tbilisi, where they were saved through the Soviet period. Scholars weren't able to access them or look at them, but now this forms the basis of the, the recreation or revival of Georgian Chan. Okay, moving on. So now we're looking at the first attempts at notation uh, in, in Western staff notation. So this is uh, 1880s, 1890s. Um, something that this is the same chant that we were just looking at. The melody is the same, uh, we think, but the harmonies are different. Uh, but there's a possibility to do comparative work because here we have just new notation. Here we start to have uh, Western notation. You'll see that um, first, this gentleman, Vasil Karbilashvili, who's the son of the last master chanter in East Georgia that I mentioned earlier, uh, he starts by writing a melody in the top voice. Interestingly, he also uses new notation that he's trying, that he uh, has from a medieval manuscript. See this, this new notation. He was, he was himself a scholar of new notation. He was trying to figure out uh, exactly what this medieval new notation, uh, yes, goodness was. So here you see a new right there, here, here. Later I'll show you some of the medieval new texts. Uh, the interesting and unique thing about Georgian medieval new notation is it's both below and, a, and above the text, and we don't know why exactly, but you see the first couple symbols below the text, above, below, below. As far as we know, he was never able to figure this out. He inherited these melodies from his father and grandfather. Then he has a medieval manuscript. We know which manuscript he had. Uh, it was written in the, in the late 10th century. But as far as we know, he wasn't able to make the, make the, the leap, make the connection. Uh, but that's you know, potential future area of study. 
you can see that there are a lot of nodes inherited through the oral tradition in comparison to the nooms. But there are nooms every five notes, maybe. So it doesn't tell us, the nooms don't necessarily tell us uh, about all of the pitches that were possible. Yeah. Is there any similarity between the medieval noom notation and the modern noom notation that was used to I'm going to get to that when we get to that section. There are some similarities, but they're definitely not the same systems. And the modern new notation, the so-called 18th and 20th century, uh, they call it Nishnebi, which means sign. That notation has a lot more signs. It's more like uh, what we were looking at with the Winchester. Um, if you have a melisma with multiple notes, they're going to have multiple signs. But this notation from 10th century Georgia, uh, it just will have this one sort of virga here and another one there, but we don't know. Uh, was, were the melodies more simplistic back then? Uh, were they not noting, notating every single sort of song note? It's unclear. Uh, as Henry mentioned, the, the Georgian medieval new notation has yet to be deciphered, though there are, are some ways, some things that we can gather from it, but I'll get to that. So just a close-up of that uh, new that, uh, staff notation. Now here's the same chant from West Georgia. And I, and I mentioned before, the traditions are different. Think different schools of Gregorian chant. They're quite different. But some things are similar. Uh, for example, the uh, I should have sung, when I go back here, let's look at this melody. So here we have, if you just look at the ears, Okay, this is East Georgian, and the way it will be harmonized will we'll show that it's very East Georgian. And now look at West Georgia. Same melody, just ornamented in different ways. But what's very different between East and West are these lower parts because this isn't a monophonic tradition, as you can see, three-part harmony tradition. So Peter Moncorite, uh, whose picture here was uh, trained as an opera star, he, was, he went to Italy, he returns in, in 1880, and um, he becomes the major figure in transcribing uh, Georgian chant. He is the Bartok of Georgia, or the, um, who's the Armenian guy, Kotaya, or um, I'm blanking on his name. But Peter uh, Monkotis has spent 25 years and transcribed some 5,000 individual chants. And it was all of his handwritten transcriptions that were then inherited after his death in 1911 by the monk who, who kept them safe through the, through the Bolshevik period. So what we're looking at here is uh, the publishing. The goal of these transcriptions um, and the reason that transcriptions were necessary is that the, the, uh, the, the process whereby the bishop had tried to preserve chant, to find the master chanters, put them in institutions, places where they could teach new students, that was marginally successful but wasn't having a big enough impact. The master chanter uh, in the 1860s, he, he trained, yes, 30 new students, but it wasn't thousands. And, and maybe 29 of those didn't become masters and didn't create their own schools. See, so it wasn't it wasn't enough. So they, when the possibility of transcribing this tradition into a European notation arose, especially with the return of a Georgian nationalist who knew notation well, uh, this became the new focus in the in the mid 1880s. Uh, we're going to divert resources from the the master chanters and their students and, and creating new schools in the in the model of oral tradition and 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 redirect resources towards really a preservational effort. The, the, the uh, leaders of this movement realized that we can try and keep this uh, Georgian chant alive, but what's really important is to, at this point, just try and preserve it, because everyone agreed it was in steep decline, almost disappearing. Uh, by the 1890s, there were no longer 100 mass chanters. It was down to like 10. Um, and indeed, the, the, the last 
of the master chanters really died in, uh, in 1907, uh, was one of the last ones, the major ones that died. His, uh, his student's student lived until 1967, and we'll get to him. He could be called the last master chanter, but uh, because he was living in the Soviet era, he was banned from ever singing. He never taught any students, so he's sort of you know, the, the very last student, like we can call him, instead of just the master chanter. All right, so I talked a little bit about the, the, the regional differences of the, of the harmony, but what's something that binds them are these melodies, which may hint at a, an origin in a monophonic tradition from the Middle Ages or late antiquity. And it's unclear when monophonic melodies imported from Palestine, Antioch, Jerusalem, somewhere, become polyphonic in the Georgian context. And that's the subject of one of those optional readings that I gave you. If that's a question that interests your own research, um, I, would be, I would be excited to hear your thoughts on, on one of the, the paper that I assigned called it, um, Dating the Origins of Medieval Georgian Polyphony. <clears throat> Publication, I talked about that a little bit. Um, the role of the publishing house was very important. Uh, because that allowed these transcriptions in European notation not to just to be a preservational effort, but also the possibility of mass production and therefore teaching from notation in all these schools. And um, what the Russians were very good at in this period was bringing in uh, European culture, and, and there were many gymnasia, schools for the aristocratic men, schools for the, for the daughters of aristocrats as well, for the women, and uh, part of the curriculum was studying music, mostly Western music, but by the 1890s, the first decades of the, of the 20th century, more and more um, teachers were hired who could do a combination of European music and Georgian music. So some of the people that were involved in publishing were Western trained musicians, ethnically Georgian, who, who take an interest in trying to preserve uh, Georgian folk music and Georgian church chant. And this is a, a pan movement that's happening across Europe to collect the folk and publish it or arrange it for piano and so forth. So we know this. Okay, so just to review some of the regional differences, there are at least three regional schools of chant that we have attested in the manuscripts and audio sources. However, there are other, probably other schools that existed um, uh, that were never transcribed because we have a, a tantalizing sort of five chants from the mountain region of Svaneti, but no one went out up there and transcribed chant. So maybe they had a full tradition. They could sing the entire liturgy. Maybe they could sing the canons. Maybe, you know, there are literally thousands of different texts throughout the Orthodox uh, calendar year that could be sung, and uh, it's possible that they had a full tradition that was never transcribed. But what we do have are about uh, a total of 20,000 pages of written transcriptions, which reflect a, probably around 3,000 individual chants. There are many copies and, and good, uh, good copy, uh, rough drafts, uh, variants of the same uh, liturgical chant texts, etc. So the model melodies in the top voice are common between all schools, but the harmonization and ornamentation varies. And that's just our map again. This picture of 19th century Tbilisi, and this, this, I like this picture because it's actually kind of, it, it shows the river coming through. This particular uh, picture is from a flood. So these, these uh, mill houses are usually out on this kind of gravel flood plain. There's a bit of water flowing through there. But on this particular day, you see the water is so high, it's come up into the street here. And people, there's like a, a crowd gathered trying to get around the street, and there's actually boats <laughs> getting through the water. Um, these are the types of cathedrals that were on the previous map. Uh, that were the regional centers. This is uh, of, of hymnography, I want to say. This is Gelati Cathedral in central Georgia. It dates from the 12th century. This is Sveti Troveri Cathedral in east Georgia. It dates from the 11th century. So these were the two major centers. Here's uh, Sioni Cathedral built in the 14th century where the patriarch served. It's right in, the, in downtown Tbilisi. Still go in there. Um, and it used to be right on the river, but then in World War II, 
German POWs built a big highway right in front of this, this balcony here. So now the river was sort of moved towards us, and now there's a big highway here. It's interesting. Here are the sons of the last master chanter in East Georgia. Um, but the, he, their, their father died in 1880, so he died just before anyone could try transcribe in European notation. So all of the transcriptions of that, of that tradition in East Georgia come from his sons. Uh, what they chanted was uh, what was transcribed in the Western notation in, in, the, in the notation that looks like this. They also experimented with different types of notation. So here you have European staff, four lines. This is actually a Georgian uh, text written here but written out in an extreme melismatic fashion. So if you sing um, five notes on the vowel A, ah, they wrote five A ah vowels, or E vowels. Uh, and it's written out diastematically, which <coughs> seems to indicate the pitch. Uh, so, but no one's, no one's reconstructed this. We don't even know what chan it's from. I can't tell you what the text is because it's literally A, ah, A, ah, E, A, ah, P, P, U, V, E, 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 A, E, A, K, A, E, A, 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 E, P, A, A, it is. It's some huge melisma. I haven't even gotten through one word yet. So it's hard to even reconstruct what the word is. And it's, you know, and it's also a 19th century orthography, so like it's unclear what this letter is. It needs a lot of work. Here's from those same brothers. Here's an example of a three-part harmony written out. And uh, from the previous examples from this, so these blue staves, you remember, he writes the first voice, the top voice first, which as we know is the model melody. Then, what do you think the second voice, or what do you think he wrote after the melody? Just judging this by looking at this. I know it's blurry, but can you tell? The bass. Huh? Bass. The bass. How do you know? I mean, the head part is the same. Exactly. It's the same ink. Uh, so we, we, we can't know fully, we can't know exactly, but it seems to indicate that. And then finally, he writes this middle voice in. And uh, this, in Eastern Georgian tradition, the middle voice is the most ornamental and, and the most improvisatory and free. So you have the model melody up here. That means fairly strict to the, the melody. The bass in East Georgia is very simplistic because the folk music in East Georgia is drone polyphony and the bass is not very talented, I tend to joke. Uh, so the, the bass is, you know, they stay within a tetrachord. They're usually harmonizing with fifths and octaves. Uh, but the middle voice is a soloist and he therefore has free reign to improvise and often does double the amount of notes. You see, if, if the top is doing, if the melody is doing a, whole, a half note, we get two notes here. But it's a quarter, you get eighth notes here. So there's literally double the amount of notes in the middle voice, and that's because the middle is sung by a solo. Now the top voice is also sung by a solo. So why isn't it also ornamented? It's one of the questions that we ask about Eastern Georgian chant. Because in Eastern Georgian folk music, it's drone polyphony with two highly ornamented solos above it. But here the top voice is not ornamented. One idea is, the Eastern Georgian chanters thought this is the canonical fixed uh, model melody. It should not be ornamented and disguised. Um, but when you go to West Georgia, the model melodies are ornamented. So they didn't have that same philosophical perspective in the West. So that sort of undermines this idea here. Anyway, those are some of the questions we ask about Eastern. Um, now, just to sort of wrap up the transcription element, the first transcription ever of Georgian chant is actually from Kiev. This is what we know of. It's in Kiev in square notation. It dates from 1832, I believe. Um, no, 1802. 1802. And we know exactly who was there. It was an aristocrat named Balam Eristavi from central Georgia. He was visiting a, a particular patriarch in Kiev who wrote down one chant only in square notation and only wrote down one voice. So was it three voice harmony or was it one voice harmony? We presume it was three and that the, that the singer just performed one voice. But it's, it's a question. Uh, so this is, uh, 
another intriguing example. And potentially, there are a lot. Text in, uh, in Slo well, it's, it looks like it's, I can't tell if it's Slavonic or if it's just like it's pre a pre-revolution. It's Cyrillic, but transliterated from Georgian. Oh. So the, 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 that explains my it. wife, who's fluent Russian, reads this and she's like, this, A, it's, it's, nonsense. it's weird to be reading Georgian in the Cyrillic alphabet. Mm -hmm. B, it was done really poorly, so it doesn't reflect the actual sounds in Georgian because Cyrillic doesn't have some of the sounds that one would produce in Georgian. So only when we take the Georgian original text and match it, match it with this one, with the Cyrillic text, can we arrive at something that I, I write about this in, in the dissertation. Uh, but it's an interesting and fascinating uh, piece, and, and hopefully there will be more that surface in other archives. If there's one here for me, to, there should be more, especially in Russia. Georgian hierarchs went to Russia repeatedly through the 18th and 19th century, and hopefully there are other transcriptions somewhere in Russian archives. So back to, now we're finished up with transcriptions, let's move to new notation. <coughs> oh, first we have to talk about some of the, the problems in editing of the transcriptions. Um, so here's a rough draft of the Pascal uh, Troper and Agdem Masashenza. You see, sort of scribbles out this. Here, uh, he has some, uh, some sections that were changed in the good copy that he makes of this rough draft. He ends up changing a bunch of notes. Uh, changes key signatures. Uh, sometimes indicates a key signature just in one voice, but then scribbles it out later. So there was a lot of trying to figure out how to, to interpret what was being sung in a non-diatonic tuning system onto the state notation. There was also an editing process when good copies of those rough drafts, this is the good copy of what we were just looking at. So this good copy gets submitted to the publisher. Uh, we, earlier we saw some of the published versions. The publisher goes through and makes his, their own set of edits. Uh, for example, uh, the way that the master chanter was saying this, they would separate the uh, last syllable, or the last con the consonant of it, uh, from the syllable. So instead of saying, they would sing they would give the final consonant of every syllable its own kind of schwa vowel this seems to be part of the oral practice which was transcribed accurately but then when it gets to the publishing phase they edit it out see he crosses out the s here and now it's just going to be crease with a slur just little things to notice so is that what was happening i think two examples ago there were like moments where there were two notes just above each other on like the endings of things, so is that sort of accounting for that? And instead of separating them, they were just placed on top of each other? Hmm. I, I'm not sure exactly what you're talking about, um, but if there were two notes aligned vertically, yeah. um, it was probably uh, two different parts singing. So it, it, in one of the moment? examples, the first and second voice was in the top staff, and the bass was in the third. But I thought it was in the one that you had shown that was like the one voice when it Kiev or the one just after it. So that one. Mm -hmm, the Kiev one? Yeah. So like on the, the very last one, mm -hmm. this uh, Oh, well, in Kiev yeah. square notation, I think this means a whole note. That's not two pitches. <laughs> okay, never mind. This is not <laughs> Thank you. Is that right? That's, do you know this notation? I do not. Yeah, this, this, when there's two pitches like this, it means it's a rhythmic thing, not a pitch thing. I see. Okay. So, yeah, you see it um, <laughs> here too. Okay. Yeah. So, sorry, I have another question. I don't want to put okay. Yeah. There were the little notes that had stems up and down. Uh, sorry. Is that just like, sorry, is that just like a wonky pen or is that also, so this is like second line from the bottom, very top, or, uh, or very Yeah, beginning. rhythmic. That's Rhythm, also. The stems are rhythmic. I see. Okay, cool. But this is, this is late. This is, um, this is late 17th and 18th century Kiev and square notation, which is based on sort of mental notation cool. in general. Um, you can pretty much sing this through uh, being literate in, in Western notation. The only thing to know are, are the rhythmic uh, sort of uh, denominations. OK, I'll this one takes forever. Can't advance it. You never know when men's real chops are going to come in. I know, right? 
reason why. <laughs> okay, so just other tiny points um, on uh, editing. For example, you see the key signature here is three flats. Uh, we hit, so therefore we have an A flat harmonized with a D flat fifth, makes sense. Then you have this G natural, which creates half step between the upper voices and a tritone between the lower voices. This type of accord would never occur in, in Georgian folk music, for example, or in any recordings that we've ever heard of Georgian chant. So the problem here is in the notational system. And this hints at uh, the, the, the Georgian singers had their own intonational system. They had their own scale uh, that we know from recordings didn't have any half steps in it. So actually what you have, this, is, this G is going to be lower. It's going to be a full step below. So that we'll have a chord like da, 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 and not da, 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 right? So when we look at these transcriptions, there are a lot of issues. You need to know a lot of information uh, in advance to sort of gain information from the transcriptions. If we didn't have them, we wouldn't have access to this, this tradition at all. But when we look at them, we need to understand that they have a lot of problems that need to be resolved. These are the types of books that, this, that these transcriptions were written into in rough draft. Um, Remember the, the, the worker in the press that I mentioned earlier who saved all of these transcriptions by burying them underground, moving them around to mon monasteries? Here's a picture of him in uh, around 1912. So Pili Monkoridze, the opera singer who made all the transcriptions, he's died in 1911. The press collapses after his death uh, and, and, and the political situation in the Caucasus is devolving. So Ektimikedis inherits all of these transcriptions. He moves to a monastery, becomes a monk, and makes it his life work to reorganize and rewrite and good copy all of the, the transcriptions. He hires this priest to help him harmonize incomplete transcriptions. There were about 1,000 chants that were written only in, in the top voice melody. They knew this was the canonical model melody, and they figured, because these master chanters are, are about to die, we need to quick transcribe as many chants as possible, and sometime at a future date, we'll harmonize them into three voices. It's an easy process. Anybody can do this. Of course, this you know it was not easy, and it was very difficult, and, and these uh, and these harmonizations are very problematic, and these therefore these chants have never been published, and they're not sung by anyone. So, the, to long story short, what you're looking at is just the top voice melody. So that's all that they had. The, the monk hires the priest to harmonize in three voice harmony. So he starts by doing the middle voice. Something like that. Does anything strike you about it? What's he doing? What's his process? Yeah, just parallel thirds. Exactly parallel thirds, which is not characteristic of either Georgian folk music or sacred music. Music, when you get past like teaching children, all right, well, at, the, at a very basic level, you might teach parallel harmony, but not when you when you've been singing chant or folk music for a while. Same chant now in three voices. Uh, uh, so it's some counterpoint, but it's very simplistic. Basically, this process was every bass note should either be a fifth or an octave below the top voice. Uh, and he harmonized 1,000 chants over the course of two years in, in this manner. Uh, and the monk, who was not uh, was was kind of a, a humble person and himself skilled at music, but hired this priest because the, he thought the priest was better. He would say he writes in the margins of a lot of his manuscripts. This seems very simplistic. Would you mind going back and checking and seeing if this is the way the, the, the correct harmonization? And the priest 
writes back in the margins, yes, I went back through this whole set of chants and everything seems perfect, etc. So this is, uh, a, here's a, um, here's, one of these, here's one of these dialogues right here. So uh, here's the monk saying, Father Rajden, you know, this, this isn't, Harmonize exactly the way I was anticipating when you might go over very, very quiet. <laughs> Here he says, says uh, you know, Father Ekftime, the, the priest, I went back through and it's all perfect. <laughs> so there's these sort of conflicts of personalities, and, and we're not sure. My personal theory is that the, that the priest, who was himself a master chanter, we know he knew the highest and most complex variants of chants because we have other transcriptions from him some 30 years before. But then he'd been teaching in these schools for aristocratic girls in the interim. And we think, I think, that uh, he, was, he was simplifying the chants because that's what his students were capable of doing. And people were no longer learning in an oral tradition, they were learning from a written tradition because that's what they were required to teach in these schools. Teach notation, teach Western music, teach piano. Uh, this is what the, the aristocrats wanted to learn in these kind of Russian style schools. So he had to simplify the chant and he was a pragmatist. He said, to preserve this tradition, we need to make it simple so that everyone can sing it and everyone can learn it. Forget that old complex stuff, the master chant of tradition is gone. And he was a bit jaded. And he and there's a lot of um, newspaper articles and, and a lot of testimonials from these from this uh, project that happened in 1912 to 1915. So it's one chapter that I read about in, in the dissertation and really interesting to me. Um, I know I got to wrap up a little bit. So one thing that interesting that happens here is someone comes through and edits. See, there used to be parallel thirds. Aksan Shekman, Aksan Shekman. But someone comes through and erases right there and creates this little rising line here, again a rising. It used to be a parallel third below that. This used to be a B below the D, so it's a rising line. So what uh, the monk did is he went and found another chanter and he said, I really don't like these these parallel third harmonizations from Brother Rajan. Can we sit through the, and go through all thousand of these chants and edit them? And they did. So you, through going through these manuscripts, uh, there's reference to this in a, in a memoir that the monk wrote in 1941. He said, I didn't like the harmonizations, I went to this other priest. So, but there are, there are dozens of manuscripts in the archives, so I thought, I gotta find which one. So I ended up finding that it was this set of manuscripts and that were erased, and you can see this is slightly different handwriting, uh, or I argue this is different types of stems, uh, the way that it's written, they're smaller and scribbled, they're different than these. They look similar, but there are a lot of differences in the way that sometimes it's one stroke, and sometimes it's a circle with a line coming down like that. Um, so just zoom through that editing process. Now, um, I'd say we go to 1120, so we're sort of over time. So why don't I um, stop there and we'll resume in two weeks with new meditation. Um, and before you go, let me give you the assignment. And uh, this a little bit and then we'll just send two minutes. There you go. Oops. Oops. Okay, so... <clears throat> Um, who was the last student of chant. He lives uh, from 1887 to 1967. In 1966, uh, they made a, about 100 recordings of him at the conservatory the year before he died. He's almost 79 years old. No one else knows any of the chants, so he records the first voice, and then they play back the first voice to him on the cassette, and he harmonizes himself. And then they play both voices back and he harmonizes himself a third time. That's awesome. <laughs> it is really a, an incredible feat. Um, 
keep this great video and create a bag. Mm. With four videos mm. of themselves. It's like you should conquer all the forms. It's like, 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 it's like,